Well, good morning. Let me begin by saying I am so appreciative of our pastor, Dave Huey, for a number of reasons. One, he is a faithful shepherd that God has placed over this flock to care for our souls. I'm also appreciative that he's allowed me the opportunity to share his pulpit this morning and preach the Word of God on his behalf. I'm also thankful for our worship teams, whether that be here in Blended or in Modern. They do such an incredible job of preparing our minds and hearts to hear the Word of God every Sunday. Would you just express your appreciation to them right now? And now that our minds and hearts are ready to hear the Word of God, I want to invite you to join me in turning in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. Our text is Mark chapter 1, verses 40 through 45. I've entitled this message, Cleansed by Christ. It was back in the summer of 2008. I was a young man in my late 20s, believe it or not, serving as a student pastor. And our church had partnered with other churches in the community to do service projects. We were assigned teams, and my team was assigned to go and paint a widow's house in an impoverished part of town. When we arrived to the house with all of our supplies in hand, we realized we were not going to be able to paint this house because it had so much growth around it. There were weeds and debris growing around the house and up on the house, so we quickly transitioned from a Motley Crue painting team to a ragtag lawn team in a matter of moments. We got the weed eaters and the mowers and the clippers and the hedgers, and we showed up and we began to clean up around the house. Well, a little bit into that project, a student came to me with my weed eater and it wasn't working. And I noticed around the head of the weed eater, it was constricted with a lot of vines wrapped around it. I didn't think much about it. I began to unwind those vines, and they kept coming and unraveling again and again. So I began to do them on my arms, and a little bit later, we go back to weed eating. It happens again, so I do it on my other arm. I didn't think much about it. We get the house cleaned up. We get it painted, and a couple of days later, I'm sitting at home, and I notice that my arms begin to break out. And after a trip to the doctor, here's what I realized is that was not just any type of vine that I unwound from that weed eater head onto my arms. It happened to be poison ivy vines. And it was by far the worst case I've ever had in my life, even up to July the 18th of 2021, right here with you. And even as I share this, my arms are starting to itch. (laughs) And you know, when you're told if you have an itch not to scratch it, it's absolutely impossible to do. And so I began to scratch it furiously, and it began to spread rapidly. And so I got my medicine, and I also went to the pharmacy and got some calamine lotion. And so if you've ever had poison ivy, and you're itching, and you're taking medicine, and you rub calamine lotion on your arms, and it dries up, you look deathly contagious. (laughs) That same week, I was starting a graduate class just up the freeway here at UALR, and I thought, if I walk into this class with my typical short sleeve polo shirt on, and I sit down with my arms broken out in poison ivy, covered in dried up calamine lotion, no one is going to sit within 10 feet of me. They're going to think I'm deathly contagious with some type of skin disease. So at that point, here's what I did. I wore a long sleeve shirt for a couple of weeks in the middle of an Arkansas summer. And so when people came into class, they weren't worried about a skin disease because I covered it up. They were more concerned about sitting next to some sweaty guy in class. <laughs> but in a very small sense, very, very small sense, I share that because it reminds me of the man in Mark chapter 1 that we're going to see today. There is a big difference, though. This man, he could not hide his skin condition. He couldn't cover it. He couldn't avoid it. He couldn't deflect from it. He couldn't medicate it. The fact of the matter was he was not going to get better. In fact, he was getting worse. And it's in the midst of this man's awful skin condition that he has this moving encounter with Christ. So I want to invite you here and in the modern service to stand in the honor of God's Word as we read Mark chapter 1, verses 40 through 45, to see this incredibly moving encounter with Christ this morning. Verse 40 begins in this way. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. 
And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places, and people were coming to him from every quarter. Let's pray. Lord God, would you open our hearts this morning to receive your word? Would you help us to correctly interpret it and rightly apply it to the areas of our life in which we need the most? For your glory and your name's sake. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. May God bless the teaching of his word. You may be seated this morning. Let's begin right off the top as we walk through this passage of being cleansed by Christ. In verse 40, who do we see here? We see, number one, the recipient of this encounter with Christ. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us much about this man at all. We're not privy to where he was born, what he once did for a living, who his family was, or even his faith background. The characteristic that is evident to us here in verse 40 is this, he was a leper. Now, a leper is somebody who contracted leprosy, which that came from the word lepros in the Greek, which would mean scale. And so it is a skin condition, and in the ancient world, the heading of leprosy could have up to 70 different skin diseases that fell under it, some minor and some major. And in this account, we don't exactly know what type of leprosy this man had. But we can cross-reference because the best interpreter of Scripture is Scripture, and Luke tells this same account in Luke chapter 5, and in Luke 5, 12, he tells us that this man was full of leprosy. Luke indicates to us he had a very severe case of leprosy. Many commentators in the study of this passage would say this man had what is known today as Hansen's disease, which is one of the worst forms of leprosy that you could contract. A man like this with a severe form of leprosy, it could start with a spot on the skin that would change colors and begin to spread, and what rapidly spread externally moved internally to attack the body. Somebody with leprosy in a severe case like this would experience extreme exhaustion, severe pain in the joints. The respiratory issues would begin to flare up, and there was a weakened immune system. The organs would be damaged, and the thing that really hurt the worst is that significant nerve damage would occur. It would make the body numb so you couldn't feel pain. So the body's warning system to let you know that something was wrong was gone. So you could be walking along and step on something sharp and have no idea until it was too late. It wasn't uncommon to hear of lepers rubbing off body parts and seeing them without fingers because over time their body just began to die away. Their eyebrows and eyelashes could fall out. A foul odor could be emitted from the sores of their skin. And there was, ultimately, the hopelessness of knowing this. There was no cure available for a man in this situation. E.W.G. Masterson wrote, No other disease reduces a human being for so many years to so hideous a wreck. Steve Lawson said of a man with leprosy, a person was literally dying in slow motion. The physical pain was beyond comprehension, but believe it or not, there is more If you go to the Old Testament in Leviticus 13, God provides numerous instructions for how his people are to deal with leprosy. The law instructed that if a person had a spot on their skin that showed up, they were to be examined by a priest in various ways over a period of time. And then the priest would tell them, you are clean or unclean. If you've ever had tests at the doctor, you know the apprehension that comes with awaiting to hear the results. Even at the dentist a while back, I was sitting there, and the lady took my blood pressure in the dental chair, and she said, do you have issues with high blood pressure? I said, only when I come in here, only when I'm here. Because you're waiting on those results, not knowing what the doctor, or in this case, the priest is going to say. The doctor may tell you you have a clean bill of health and you're good to go. Or maybe you start new medications. Or maybe you have to schedule a surgery. Or it's going to be, uh, possibly be the statement, I'm sorry. There's nothing more that we can do. And a person with a skin condition was fearfully waiting to find out their fate from the priest. The thought of having leprosy was terrifying in the ancient world. It would literally be like hearing, I'm sorry, there's nothing more that we can do. See, lepers were considered unclean in the Mosaic law. And Josephus wrote of lepers, they were treated as if they were living dead men. They were cut off. They were outcast from society, which was the worst stigma for an Israelite. 
Many were forced to live in isolation or out in leper colonies. They could not gather with their friends, family, with the community, and most importantly, corporately with the people of God. This is probably the status of the man that we're looking at in Mark chapter 1 with his skin condition. But here's the most humbling part for us to consider. Even though in the room this morning, we may not be physical lepers, but every single one of us either are or were spiritual lepers. You see, we've all been infected by the disease of sin, and it has spread rapidly to our souls, contaminating us to the core. It has multiplied in us, making us numb to the good things of the Lord and desensitized to the wickedness that exists in our world today. And just like the leper is isolated from society, you and I are isolated and separated from God, just like Adam and Eve in the garden, because of our sin. This is the recipient of the encounter with Christ today. He is a reflection of who we either are or were spiritually. And the leper comes to Christ in the next part of verse 40. And as the recipient, he makes number two, the request. Notice the request that he makes here. Just think about this man as he's walking down the street publicly towards Jesus. There are some that might have ran to the other side of the street, fearful that they were going to potentially catch this contagious disease. Others were probably utterly speechless, just dumbfounded, at a loss for words at what they were actually seeing as this man publicly approached Christ. Then, no doubt, others shouted at the man with anger and rage and fury. But it's important to see how Mark here in verse 40 portrays this man approaching Jesus in the midst of his request. Mark shows us the position of his body, and the reason is it reflected the posture of this man's heart. He came to Christ in full, complete, and total humility. Mark says here that the leper was first imploring him. Now, the Greek for the word in the phrase imploring him is parakaleo, and what that means is desperation. He was desperately beseeching, calling for, begging, and entreating Christ. He is coming as a broken, shattered man, groveling before the feet of our Lord Jesus. Mark writes here, he's kneeling before the man. If you look at the account in Luke, Luke tells us that he fell on his face and he's begging before Jesus. And notice what he says to Christ here. He says, if you will, you can make me clean. He knew Jesus could, but I'm not convinced that the leper knew that he would. In Matthew's account, it's interesting because if you look at Matthew 8, verse 2, the leper actually calls Jesus Lord. The humility of this man is evident in his request because he recognized who he was before a holy God. He saw in perspective his wretched condition compared to an infinitely holy God standing there on the street before him. And the leper realized he reached the point that there was no other way. There was no doctor to visit. There was no help or hope coming from somewhere or someone. There was no therapy to complete. There was no pill to swallow, no life coach to follow, no self-help book to read, no mantra to repeat. It was only Jesus that could fix this. It was only Jesus that could do this. See, the leper is not only who we are spiritually, isolated, filthy, disease-ridden with sin, separated from God. He is also an example of how you and I are to come to Christ. See, there's not a way for us to do this on our own self-effort and merit. You know, we should be pulling up our bootstraps in so many areas of our life and working harder and trying harder and doing better. But the one area that we cannot pull our bootstraps up in is in the area of salvation. You and I are helpless and hopeless to save ourselves. Salvation isn't one of those things we can do on our own. See, if we're to come to Christ, we're to come like the leper. We're to come in pouring begging, kneeling, falling on our faces, submitting to him as Lord, not caring what anybody else on the street thinks, knowing he is the only way in full, complete, and total humility, just like the leper. It's not that we come to Christ and do him some grand favor by accepting him as if he needs us at all. Here's the picture, is that he is kind, forbearing, patient, loving, and merciful enough to accept us in our wretched condition. Have you come to Christ like the leper? Do you see yourself spiritually separated from him, knowing he is the only way? Have you recognized your helpless and hopeless condition apart from Christ compared to who he is? If so, 
Here's what you're going to experience leperly. Here's what you're going to experience spiritually as you see what the leper did in verse 41 with number three, the response. Notice here in the text the response of Jesus to this man. If anyone could have been angry at the leper this day, it could have and it should have been Christ because he had the right to do so. This man is breaking the Mosaic law that is stated in Leviticus. And I think we would all agree Christ's response that day was totally different than anybody else on the street. Just think how the Pharisees and Sadducees would have approached this man and treated this man. Notice how Jesus, first in the text, we see him responding internally, which was then displayed beyond our imaginations externally. The first thing we see in verse 41 is that Jesus was moved with pity. He was full of, he was overflowing with pity. He was overflowing with what is probably written in many of your Bibles, because it's reflected in many of the original biblical manuscripts, the word compassion. The meaning of this phrase is that he felt it deep in his gut. Down at the bottom of his stomach, within his bowels, Jesus could feel the plight of this man like no other. And our compassionate Lord, he doesn't shrink back, does he? No, he actually steps forward and leans in towards the man. And he could have healed him with just words. Christ did that before. Christ also healed with words, and he also accompanied his words with a touch. And that's what made it so significant here. He didn't just say it to the leper. He showed it by doing the unthinkable. The text tells us here in Mark, he stretched out his hand and touched him. He touched an untouchable. Think of the response on the street. I mean, they probably thought, oh my goodness, Jesus here before us, he has broken the Mosaic law. He is now unclean. He might have leprosy, but that wasn't the case. This man could not make Jesus unclean any more than you and I with the worst of the worst about us could ever make Jesus unclean. There is nothing we could do to make Christ unclean. And just think this sinless, pure, altogether lovely Son of God dwells in us as wretched sinners and he remains as holy as ever, constantly making intercession on our behalf before the Father. Be assured, this touch, it was no glancing brush. It was no tap. It was no patch you on the shoulder or a fist bump. The Greek word here is hopto, and what this means is he adhered to him. He fastened him. Jesus grabbed this man. And this man, considering his condition that we just saw, he probably had not been touched in years. He had not shaken his friend's hands. He had not hugged his wife or kissed his children. Consider how he felt to experience someone touching him, grabbing him, fastening to him, unconcerned about his condition, not worried about what he was bringing to Christ that day. Christ received him. That was his response. Consider this man, how it felt to not only have somebody touch you, but the literal hand of God gripping you. And notice what Jesus says to him as he touches him. He says, I will. And that's written in the present tense because it's important to recognize this because Jesus says, I will heal you, but it also means that Jesus is ever present and willing to heal all who will come to him as this leper did. In John chapter 6, verse 37, while addressing his sovereignty and salvation, here's what Jesus says, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. If you come to Christ willing If you come to Christ in humility, you're going to get the same response as the leper did. Jesus is not going to turn you away. Will you just come? Do you think you've strayed too far? Come and be cleansed. Do you think you've committed a sin that he's not going to forgive? Would you come and be cleansed? Here on the freeway, we often have people that will come in for assistance. We had a young man come in. He's probably about 22 years old. I happened to be the pastor that was here that day to visit with him. And he didn't ask for any money. He didn't ask for any assistance physically at all. He wanted to talk about spiritual needs. And he was afraid, as he told me, that he had committed sins that God would not forgive. And he was weeping, and he was crying, and he was broken, but he would not come and be cleansed. And after an hour and a half with this young man, I could not convince him that if you will come, Scripture is clear, Christ will not cast you out. If you're sitting here and you don't think God's going to forgive you of what you've done, if you will come, he will receive you. He will accept you. Notice what he did to the worst of the worst stigmas of the day. He touched the leper. He healed the leper. And you will get the same response in your heart and soul if you will humble yourself and come. 
After Jesus touched the man, here's what we see in verse 42. We see number four, the results. This recipient comes to Christ. He makes this request. We see Jesus' response to his request, and now we see the results of it all. What was the result? Mark uses the word in verse 42, immediately. Now, if you read the book of Mark, you realize that's one of his favorite words because he uses it over 40 times in his gospel. Mark's gospel is literally a jab cross. It is a fast one-two narrative on the life of Christ. And if you're not anywhere in the Word right now, why don't tomorrow you pick up the book of Mark and start reading through it? 16 chapters, it is fast-paced, it'll be easy to retain and read, but it will do wonders for your soul. And what is it that happened? Why is it so significant that the word immediately is included by Mark in this portion of the text? Because it's clear, two things happened immediately. Look with me. First, the leprosy left him. It was removed. And then secondly, he was made clean. See, Jesus not only touched the untouchable, he actually cured the incurable. The leper's skin at that moment would have smoothed. The foul odor would have dissipated. Sores would have vanished. Pain would have departed. His immune system would have strengthened. Hair would have grown back. His breathing returned to normal and his voice strengthened. Organs would have been repaired. His nerves would function again where he could feel. If he had lost fingers and toes, they would have been restored. He could now go home. He could now work. He could gather with God's people. No more isolation, no more leper colonies, no more covering his face and body in public, putting his hair a certain way, walking down the street shouting, unclean, unclean, to let people know that he was in their presence. He was free. Don't you long spiritually to have the same freedom from your sin that this leper experienced physically this day? Oh, I do. Leprosy was something that got progressively worse as we've seen. But did you notice the man did not get progressively better that day on the street with Christ? When Jesus touched him, what happened? He got immediately better. And when Jesus touched him, he was transformed on the spot from unclean to clean. It was an instant, total, whole, complete healing. And the same is true for any of us, any man, woman, boy or girl who would come to Christ. Like leprosy, sin grows in our lives. And when we're born into sin, we grow up into this depravity. And we don't get better. We actually get worse. But in the midst of the worst of the worst sins that we could commit, how long does it take for us to be forgiven? The moment we come to Christ, just like that. The moment he touches us, we're cleansed. We call that biblically regeneration. What that word means is to be made alive. It's to be born again. And this is the same emphasis that Jesus makes to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 3. See, the two things that happen to the leper really mirrors what happens to you and I when we do come to Christ. Notice the first thing there, when Christ touched him, the leprosy was removed. When we come to Christ, the penalty of sin is removed off of our lives. We call that, theologically speaking, expiation. It is taken away from us, the penalty of sin. It was put onto Christ in our place. But then secondly, we see he was made clean. See, at salvation, we're also given something. He was given a clean skin, a clean body here, a clean position. As salvation, we're given a clean position before the Lord. We're given the righteousness of Christ. We call that theologically imputation. He experienced both of these. And have you experienced both of them in your soul, your heart, your life this morning? Have you been cleansed? The response of Christ was to touch him, and the result was healing. If you come to Christ, his response will be to forgive your sins. It's kind of like the hymn, Oh, He Touched Me. Now, I would sing this for you this morning, but it would really be unfair to John because he'd be out of a job on Monday if you guys heard me sing this. (laughs) So I'm simply going to read this to you. Oh, He Touched Me. Oh, He Touched Me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know He touched me and made me me whole. This is what happened to the leper. This is what happens to us when we come to Christ in humility. It's this miraculous encounter with Christ that Jesus gives the man here in verses 43 and 44 as we move through the text. Number five, a restriction. 
Now, we see a very abrupt shift in this passage. If you look, Jesus moves from being very tender with the man to very tough. And then Mark says here that Jesus sternly charges him. Now, in the original, this would mean that Jesus said this with a bit of a grunt or a snort. In other words, Mark wants us to know that Jesus' warning to this man is very direct and straightforward. He's not mincing any words in his address to this man. And what is Jesus' warning after he healed this man? He tells the man, don't tell anybody. Say nothing to anyone. Now, this warning seems very bizarre, doesn't it? I mean, are we not to go to everyone, everywhere, and every time and proclaim the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ? Is this not our marching orders that Christ gave to us in his words before he ascended to heaven to sit down rightfully at the right hand of the Father after he has finished his work on earth? Why this restriction? Well, first remember, while on earth, Christ, he was fully God, but he was also fully man, and he limited himself to a physical body. If you want to read a bit on Christ's deity and his humanity, read in Philippians 2. It's helpful commentary in understanding that deeper. So he wasn't omnipresent everywhere in the sense when he was on earth because he was in an earthly body. And so if this man spread the message too quickly, here's what would happen. It would hinder Jesus to be able to physically minister the way that he intended to because the crowds were coming. That's more of the practical request here. But there's also a spiritual request and command. Secondly, Jesus gave the restriction to the man because Christ has wanted his message to be about the word. He wanted it to be about salvation. He wanted it to be about the truth. He didn't want the attention to be on miracles and healings and signs and wonders and frenzy and emotion. Jesus wasn't looking for a feel-good health and wealth prosperity gospel because there is no such true gospel that accompanies those things. He was not looking for superficial, shallow followers who wanted the gifts of the faith minus the God of the faith. And he knew that such miracles would create the wrong perception of who he was and what he came to do. A couple weeks ago, I was running in downtown Little Rock. I'm just running the grids of the street back and forth. And I happened to see a young man on the side of the street who was a Mormon. And he was handing out some information. And I thought, I've got some information for you as well. I'll take yours if you take mine. And so we began to talk. And young man, very nice, very friendly. He's about to go play football at BYU. And we finally came to the conclusion. And I just told him, we're talking about two different Jesuses here. And if you misinterpret the Jesus of the Bible as the people of the day were misinterpreting him as the Messiah, the Christ, here's what's going to happen. You get the wrong Jesus, you get the wrong gospel. And if you get the wrong gospel, you're getting condemnation, not salvation. And Christ always wanted his message to be about him, the truth, the way, the, the life, the word of God. Jesus here, he accompanies this restriction that he gives to the man with number six, as we'll see in verse 44, the requirement. Now, we have this negative phrasing from Christ where he tells the man, don't go tell people. And then we have a positive phrasing where Jesus actually tells him to go and do something. And in verse 44, Jesus gives the requirement that's found in the Old Testament. If a person didn't have fatal case of leprosy and they were healed and they became well, there were specific steps to follow according to the Levitical law in Leviticus 14 for them to be declared clean. Now, we won't dive into all those details because it's a lot of stuff there, but it included things like being washed and bird sacrifices and quarantine and being anointed with oil and then finally pronounced clean by a priest. And what Jesus is telling this man to do is go give testimony to the priest. Because if he did that, here's what would happen. It would be an undeniable display of Christ's power to the priest. It would have proved his healing, and in proving his healing, it would have in turn verified the message that Christ came to preach. This wasn't some psychosomatic healing. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that term, but think of it like this. You turn on the television at night and you see a healing crusade, and you see all of these people coming. And the ones in the worst condition, they keep them in the back and they ignore them. But they bring somebody on the platform who maybe has a hurt knee. It's like, ah, oh, my knee hurts. And they get caught up in the moment and the emotions and the smoke and the lights and the music and everything that's going. And their adrenaline kicks in and suddenly their knee starts feeling better and they're moving around. Well, after the crusade, they go on home and they sit down in their recliner and their knee starts to bother them again. There's no adrenaline. There's no emotions. 
There's no smoke, there's no lights, there's no music, and the pain returns. This happens all the time at these so-called healing crusades. But here's the catch. Any of these miracles that these guys on TV claim to do, they're always unverifiable. I mean, how many times has Benny Hinn said that he raised somebody from the dead? We've never met that person and we never will because they don't exist. How many times have you heard somebody like a Kenneth Copeland go, I rebuked a tornado back in the sky? Well, great, show me the video. I would love to see that. There is no video because it doesn't exist. These charlatans, phonies, and hucksters are all on TV claiming these things that are unverifiable. But look at the difference between all of the false teachers that exist today compared to our Lord. He verified exactly what he did. He proved who he was by what he did and what he said. And he verified this miracle by sending the man to the priest to go, see, it's been known that many rabbis said it was easier to raise somebody from the dead than to heal somebody with a severe form of leprosy. And Christ was doing the unthinkable miracle here. Let me just say, though, there is something way more powerful than miracles, emotions, feelings and frenzy and signs and wonders. In fact, for us on our own, no matter what the person on the street might say, a miracle will never be enough for them. A great example of this, and to kind of chase a rabbit down the trail of Luke chapter 16, Jesus tells the story of the rich man and Lazarus. You know that Lazarus goes to be with the Lord and and the rich man is separated from God. And Abraham in the story says this, in Luke 16, 31, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. See, the rich man said, would somebody rise from the dead and go tell my brothers? If they see this, they'll believe. You see what Abraham said? He said, they've got the word of God. They've got the prophets. They've got Moses. If they don't believe that, they're not even going to believe if somebody rises from the dead to tell them. Peter echoes this in 2 Peter 1.19. Peter tells us of some miraculous things he saw, particularly the transfiguration he's referencing there, which you can read about in Matthew 17. Here's what he says. I saw some miraculous things, but I've got the prophetic word even more fully confirmed. Peter's telling us, I saw some great things, but I got something more verifiable. The word of God. We are to seek the word of the Lord as the people of God, first and foremost. In 1 Peter 1.25, Peter tells us, quoting Isaiah, the word of the Lord remains forever. It's okay to be passionate people. We must have the light of the word and the heat of our hearts and be on fire for the Lord. But we can't get caught up in signs and wonders and emotions and miracles and think, if that stuff didn't happen, Christ wasn't present. Christ was present, and he is present because his word is opened up and is spoken. The purpose of miracles every time were to glorify God and to verify his message at particular times in the scriptures. And now you and I, we actually have something better. The completed, the authenticated, the total word of God. And that's enough. That's enough. Then finally, there are number seven, some ramifications for what happened in this man's disobedience to Christ. We see he did not do what Christ told him to do in this request. So in verse 45, he spread the news. And as a result, Jesus was swarmed by people when he entered into towns. And if Jesus didn't enter enter into a town, believe it or not, the crowds came looking for him. And we see examples of this. And the results were these large crowds gathered around Jesus, often for what they might get. They wanted the healing, the signs, and the wonder. And as soon as the curtain was dropped on the show, they were not interested in hearing any more that Christ had to share with them. And they went home. You know, it's interesting to listen to some so-called church growth experts out there today. And biblically speaking, there's only one church growth expert. His name's Jesus. Matthew 16, 18, he says, I will build my church. Did you hear those pronouns in that? But by their standards and by many people's standards in the evangelical word, world, Jesus would have been wildly unsuccessful. I mean, think about this. He could do miracles, and for three years he did. He even arose from the dead and appeared to hundreds of people. Then we see before he ascended in Acts chapter 1, there were only 120 people praying. They would have sent Jesus packing. They would have cut his funding, took his building back, and redistributed his team somewhere else because they didn't stick around to see what the power of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit can do through believers who are caught on fire. We should want people to come to Christ from every place, every time. 
In our effort, though, we can't get caught up in bait-and-switch strategies like Christ prohibited in his ministry. We can't try to keep topping ourselves every week. We must be centered on the message because it's central to who we are. Joel Beakey said, mindless Christians will become spineless Christians. Now, why do I chase this rabbit down the trail, down the hole? Because the last thing the world needs, and I think we can get this from Christ's emphasis here, are superficial Christians in shallow churches. And the reason we don't need those is because these people in these churches have nothing to offer the spiritual lepers that exist in the world. The spiritual lepers who come, they need to hear the truth of God's word, which is wrapped up in the grace and mercy that he will provide to us if we will come. As we conclude this morning, let me ask us three questions to consider. And you may be sitting there going, well, I appreciate you preaching to us, but please know I preached this to myself many times this week before I even got here. And I've had to ask myself some questions, and so I'm going to ask these of you as well. Number one, do you treat people like Christ treated the leper? And we have to examine ourselves. Do we have the pity, the empathy, and compassion like Christ, not only individually, but collectively as Geyer Springs, could the spiritual leper come in here and be received and accepted? It's reflected in how we personally and collectively treat others. I was once serving on a church staff, and there was a particular family that came, and they had all the marks that this particular leader in the church wanted. I mean, they lived in the right part of town. They were well-connected, and they had an abundance of resources at their disposal. And the leadership of the church, they were adamant, particularly this one leader, that we pull out all the stops and get this family. And I remember being told, I better reach out to their children in various ways because we had to have this family. It would be huge for us. First, there's nothing wrong with wanting a family like this in your church. And there's nothing wrong with having the things that God has blessed us with, whether that be possessions or influence. The problem is when you think you must have somebody like this to do the work of the Lord, you don't. Theology 101, God doesn't need anyone. Second, I couldn't help but wonder as I was sitting there being pushed to do this, is would this leader have put the same effort into a family who lived on the other side of the tracks, who had no inroads into the community, and the ones they did were flawed, and had a measly offering to give every month? And of course, we all know the answer to that, no. And it hit me in that moment that if my family when I was a child, would have visited, we wouldn't have given the time of day. We wouldn't have been given the time of day because we didn't have much to offer. Let that never be said of us as a people of God here at Geyer Springs, that we would show favoritism for, towards one person and not another, that when these doors are open, regardless of what you have, where you've been, or what you've done, you are welcome to come and join us. How we treat broken, hurt, and hurt people in our neighborhoods and cities who walk through this door reflect our relationship with God. We see how Christ dealt with the leper. We in turn see how he has dealt with us, and we owe it to others to treat them in that way. It's a two-handed approach. We are guarding the purity of this church with our lives, but we are inviting all of those to come in and be cleansed. Secondly, let me ask you, are you living with unconfessed sin? Even though you might be in Christ, you still sin just like I do. And you may be here this morning and there is some unconfessed sin that has taken hold of you. And let me tell you, if you do not seek to kill the sin that you are caught up in, it will spread like leprosy in your life, in your home, and in this church. And it will hinder the work of the Lord. Today, if that's you, where you sit, I invite you to turn from that sin and give it to the Lord and trust Him him. I invite you to come to the altar. would be open if you would want to pray. And then thirdly, let me ask you this. Have your sins been cleansed by Christ? Studying this passage, I came a couple of people who mentioned, I came across a couple of people who mentioned the irony found here. It's interesting to note, the leper was away from everybody so long, and Christ was in the middle of the city. As soon as they met and Christ healed him, the leper found himself in the middle of the city and Christ was the one that was isolated. In an ironic sense, they switched places. And that reminds us of exactly what Christ has done for us on the cross. He has switched places for us to absorb the wrath of God. And we see all the physical pain that a leper experienced. 
And we see Jesus experience a tremendous amount of physical pain on the cross. The leper was isolated from everyone. It was at that moment on the cross, Christ experienced separation as God's wrath was poured out on him for the sins of all those who would ever believe. Have you believed? Have you come to Christ like the leper? If not, we will be here to share with you what the Word of God says about how you can be cleansed.